So welcome to our talk on better user and editor experience, exploring open data on GovCMS. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Matt Pirani, the web manager from the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority. Uh, IPI is a small agency, we're only 64 people, and we primarily, you know, our primarily function is to uh, audit or and report on parliament, parliamentarians and staff's expenses. And I'm Julia, and I'm an account manager and project manager at Morphed. <coughs> um, Morphed is a digital agency located in Sydney, and we specialise in building sites on the GovCMS platform. Setting the scene. So providing some context and giving a bit of background um, just be and some general notes before we dive into our presentation. So an alternative to this talk could have been how to cram a square peg into a, into a round hole. Um, the site has not been launched yet. It's uh, due to be launched on the 9th of November. And Matt and I have been focused over the last few months in delivering this site. Luckily, we're still friends and we can be in the same room together. It has been a challenge. It has. Um, the project has pushed boundaries on the platform and it could not have been delivered without some help. So I think we want to start off by uh, having a big shout out to GovCMS, Salsa and Amazi for their incredible support in helping us with this challenging site that we've been building. Oh, great. Going through that one. Um, yeah, so our, is. Yeah, as I said before, our primary primary function is to uh, audit and advise on parliamentarians and their staff's expenses. So, part of the one of the major parts of the site is to display all that data, and it's been quite a challenge to get it to to work in its current form. Uh, our current website. So, we're currently on Drupal Seven Pass. Uh, the website was built approximately five years ago and we've included uh, the addition of two custom modules and multiple other modules which are currently or which are, are not available on uh, D9 SAS. Uh, the website, uh, the, well, the critical area of our site is around the reporting of the expenses. <coughs> uh, the current process that we, that we undertake to update those, that data is a very time consuming process and uh, one of our key deliverable to look, key deliverables for this site was to enable our users or our internal users the ability to update all the data as easily as possible. Next slide. Uh, yep. yep. Um, so, whenever we start a project, and I think this would be normal for most digital agencies, uh, we go through a series of discovery sessions, and in this case, we had several um, stakeholders uh, that we had to consult with um, and uh, we recorded lots of feedback um, during those sessions and I've got to say that probably in this project um, we did much more discovery and much more documentation than we normally would have done. We recognised that the project had a significant issue to resolve and this was primarily around the uploading and delivery reports um, that contained complex data sets. As a result, um, our solution architect, Murray Woodman, spent a lot of time planning and mapping out the content model and the IA. And you can see here uh, sort of the, the mind map that we came up with. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about the different content types um, that we, we delivered in this project. But um, effectively, we came from a D7 site, which had five content types and we ended up with 18 content types. Um, and this implementation was really key to our success as we were then able, as you'll see later in our presentation, to use solar and indexing to only query the data we needed for key reporting pages. We were also conscious that there were features that would be hard to reproduce on the GovCMS SAS platform. Um, I don't know how many of you in the room uh, are familiar with GovCMS, um, but the SAS platform uh, is a locked distribution, and we were coming from a D7 site which had some custom modules, so, and, that, and they were not modules that we could introduce into the SAS platform. Um, and there are also other modules which would have been so useful in this project, like Views Data Export, which we could not use either. Um, so. Um, we 
planned in a number of ways and one of the one of the key things that we really wanted to demonstrate very early on was the fact that we could do some data imports into the site that could be actually controlled by content editors. Um, so we did a, a proof of concept very early on um, to, to basically demonstrate that we could deliver that key deliverable. So the key challenges and project risks. We were aware we had many challenges to solve in this project and we were not 100% confident that everything would work and there was a level of risk in the project. We aimed for an MVP and knew there would be some <coughs> unresolved features and functionality that would not get delivered in the initial launch for November. So from the discovery and define sessions, we could clearly articulate the core KPIs for project success. So feedback from our uh, initial consultations with our users really highlighted the fact uh, that we needed to improve the information architecture, the search functionality, and the findability of our content, which was a lot of the time it was very buried. So one of the big improvements was the, the need for improved search. So Morph's strategy was to introduce more content types to support the reporting data sets. We created essentially what I now look back on and see as four very distinct different types of content types. So the first group of content types were centered around the data imports. Um, there were 10 of these content types. Um, these content types were specifically reserved for the importing functions, the solar indexing, reporting pages which are rendered using views displays, and then other content <coughs> types that were also lazily created, uh, which enhanced the SEO and future extendability of the site. Probably the most important uh, content type in this set was uh, the introduction of the person content type which became a key focus for the new website. We then had um, two presentation um, content types, and these were for collections and sections. So collections were pages where we were displaying uh, the, view, the views data, the reports, essentially, with the, the facets and the filters that we introduced. And then the sections, I guess you could see, as primarily like a, a landing page, um, and they were generally sort of edge-to-edge -edge, um, displays. Within our third content type was um, a classification content type, and uh, I think uh, this is one of the things I find most hard to, to explain, but effectively, if you imagine that you have a series of articles like blogs, um, they're classified in a listing page, which is a, its own content type called blog. Does that make sense to people? Yeah? Great. Awesome. Scored that one. How many of those? So the, the beauty of doing it this way is that you as a content editor can create as many article types or publication types that you like. So you have a classification content type and then it, the yeah. article type is a taxonomy. Yeah. So traditionally in Drupal, you know, you would use a taxonomy to do that. Yep. Um, the way that Morph does it is that we actually create content types for that. And the benefit of that is, is that you get your, your, your listing from your, your view display mode, but you can actually edit the top area yourself without going back to a developer. Whereas when you use taxonomies and use like a, a view display straight off, there's no way yeah. that you can actually manipulate you know, the top part, like the banner and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and it's one of the things that, like, you know, as I've been working with Morph, I've kind of really grown to kind of appreciate uh, this innovation. Uh, so the final group of content types is for general content, like, you know, about us, news items, fact sheets, are kind of the, the kind of singular unit. The introduction of the content types has allowed IPU's content to be more discoverable more flexible and has highlighted many of the shortcomings of the current the current website. A key K KPI for this project was to make all our content more searchable and findable. So, so the architectural design and content modelling at the start of the project served us really well. Having well-defined content types that served a specific purpose delivered many positive outcomes for the project. The initial define and design work fed into every part of the build and was intrinsic to delivering both the requirements and the desired improvements for the website. So our next KPI. Yes. 
Uh, so the main the main goal was uh, for our internal auditors, or auditors, editors, sorry, uh, to be able to manage their own content, but also the upload of our data sets. Uh, the current process um, for our content editors is to create a feature branch, upload all the data, the CSVs, uh, PDFs, etc., all into that feature branch, and then with the, the assistance of a third party to have to then export the database and then re-import it into the production site. Uh, so that's been one of our issues that we've been trying to resolve because it's very timely and very, very time consuming and very costly. So um, Morph's approach to this challenge was to use the media entity and the migrate module, um, which are both available within GUS CMS SAS. Um, so we, we created media entities for each report and the content editor can then upload each of the reports um, or each of the new CSVs into these media entities. Um, and all up, there were five data sets they need to upload for each reporting period. Once a CSV is uploaded, the content editor then imports the data using the migrate module. Before going live, the data needs to be verified. Um, and that's quite easy for the smaller data sets um, where you can, we, we've built out these content lists in the admin area where they can actually visually check. Um, and the smaller data sets might be eight, 15 rows. Um, but we had um, a particular challenge um, around the detailed report, which could have 25,000 plus rows of data. Um, and that's what really did our head in on this project. Um, this a capacity to verify that data is actually currently unresolved for us. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, like if you're in the if you're in the wild building this Drupal site outside of Gov CMS, um, you would turn to probably something like Use Data Export as a solution. Um, but we didn't we don't have that at the moment. Right. But we may working we might. On yeah we are working on it. Yeah. Uh, so the current process uh, is for the, for the management of the site or for the upload is for all the P PDFs to be uploaded via SFTP, imported uh, via C and the import of the CSVs via feeds import. The database dump via Lagoon. Uh, the, this, this process, on average, could take up to seven hours of time. So, and that's with the the assistance of a third party. Um, so, this process or this project we've morphed. We've tried to reduce, reduce that down by fifty percent to allow us to you know, carry on doing other tasks. So, the solution now empowers the IPIA team members to manage the reporting data inputs themselves without the need of an, or assistance of a third party. And the new site takes um, two to three hours to upload and publish the data sets for each um, quarterly reporting period. <coughs> yeah, so part of, the, part of this requirement uh, was, for, was to allow our site visitors the ability to view our data and the ability to search, uh, to search filter each data set. Because uh, typically where we, our, our data gets reviewed by journalists, etc., looking to see what our parliamentarians are doing. So but the ability to have the, the data to be able to slice and dice has been really good. So the current site was struggling to deliver all the required reports for each period. Sometimes the site was stalling and pages were taking several minutes to load. Um, and I don't think that that is uh, a mark of how the site was developed. I just think when the site was developed five years ago, there was no concept of how much data needed to be actually held in the system um, for the reports to be delivered. So our solution uh, used a mixture of solar filters and facets, as well as the introduction of new content types. Moving from Drupal Search to Solar provided more flexible indexing of content. When you visit the current D7 website report section, the CMS is querying all of the data for each reporting period. We changed this with a new build so that Solar is only querying portions of the data set required for the particular report a user is viewing. So if you go back to the start of our presentation where we showed you all of those content types, that was key uh, to the solution that we came up with. As a result, we are using less server resources and are able to deliver the required content to the site visitor more quickly and efficiently. Um, so we also worked on improving the user experience. Um, so we introduced um, filters and facets 
um, that allowed better inter interrogation of the content. Um, so, for example, on the old site, there was no way um, to compare a parliamentarian's expenditure across different reporting periods on the same page. So with the new um, design that we were able to um, implement on the site, MOFT was able to deliver this feature. So you can see here that you can actually um, search by, um, uh, you can see here that the, the solar indexing and how that's delivering these different facets, um, which we can now use on the page. You can also select um, a name and a state and see all parliamentarians that meet this criteria. Um, so this was something that we only really sort of uncovered as we went through the early stages and the mid-stages of the project was, and it took a while for the penny to drop, that um, a parliamentarian could have two reports for the one period. Um, and it took some time to uncover this requirement. And so what it is, is an MP, if they're in parliament or they're working in their electorate, have two distinct reports and they have to be shown at the same time. Likewise, if you think about it, um, you could start a reporting period with the Prime Minister, and as we've experienced in previous years, that Prime Minister can become a former Prime Minister and require a different report. So I think that was one of the, like, I don't know how much we talked at the beginning, yes. but we, it still took another month or two to uncover that issue. Um, so as Matt mentioned, the previous site relied on um, a PDF for each parliamentarian within each reporting period. This entailed the uploading of over 200 PDFs every reporting period. Uh, Morph introduced the concept of person um, to replace the requirement for the PDF. And when visiting the person page, the expenditure reports are shown in summary format for each category. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've um, base that on the accordion component. Um, so when you land on these pages, you'll see there that everything's scrunched down into an accordion with a summary, and the summary um, shows the total expenditure for each one of those categories. And then someone can go in and expand each one of those accordions to actually see um, the reporting detail. Um, this page also at the top um, includes a drop-down menu, so you can jump from one reporting period to another. Um, so one of the other really nifty things that I you know, feel like Morph has done on this project and one of the things that really challenged me when I was first looking at this site um, was this requirement to be um, on the what we call the aggregate report and to then be able to link through from that to a detailed report. So for in this example, you can see uh, we've got selected the January to March 2019 period. And you'll see there that we've got Bill Shorten and we've got this um, amount for travel allowance of 13,290. And when you click on that, it'll take you to the transactional um, data uh, with uh, pre-selected uh, the facets to deliver that particular information. <coughs> so we, we required a solution that was going to be stable, delivered better, more flexible, uh, provided more flexible reporting, including the slicing and dicing of our information so that our users could explore and extract better information from our site. Moft was able to deliver a structure that was better suited for the amount of data that the site needed to serve. We believe the solution we have come up with is highly flexible and will serve EPO well now and into the future. So another requirement for us was to ensure that all our content, the website, etc., met all, all uh, WCAG requirements and inclusivity and accessibility, but also to be available and readily viewable on all devices as well. Um, so IPIA and MOFT worked together to introduce specific features that supported the display of general pages, but also specifically the reporting pages, which is the focus mm. of our talk today. And the, the tables were a particular challenge because we were dealing with many um, columns of data. Um, so some of the things that we, we, we looked at and implemented was like the font selection. So we introduced um, monospace fonts for, for numeric characters, um, and this made the data within the um, table structure more legible. 
we introduced filters and facets uh, and these I'm um, just a bit lost here, but sorry. Um, so yeah, and uh, we collect, and these could be collapsed. So when when you visit these pages, um, they load expanded so that you can see them, but then you can crunch them down so that you can see more data um, on on the browser window. Um, part of our design included the display of reports to be edge to edge. Um, so this was a specific challenge as it made sense from a content perspective, but in terms of visual appeal, it did on initial viewing um, make the page look like it was a bit broken. We worked around this by making the search background edge to edge, which you can see the faded um, green area in our slide there. Um, and this visual element remediated some of the concerns that IPIA had. Uh, we did comprehensive testing and tweaking to make best efforts to minimise side-to-side -side scrolling on laptop and desktop computers. We also um, introduced this stackable view for the tables on um, mobile devices. Um, and this again removed uh, the need to scroll side-to-side -to, -side to inspect the data. Um, and it provides an easier way to view the reports on smaller devices. So one of the biggest improvements that we've had uh, has been the, the ability to search by name over any reporting period. This has allowed the user to be able to compare any report on any specific parliamentarian over any selected uh, period of time. Consideration of the report displays took some time on this project. It was important that we made best efforts to improve the legibility of data for the broadest range of users. We achieved this by considering the font we used in the reporting tables, utilising the maximum amount of space on the browsers, but also configuring that space to minimise scrolling for different devices. <coughs> Due to the size of our agency of you know, 64 people, there's no internal resources uh, that we have to be able to maintain all the Drupal updates on PASS. So we relied heavily on third parties to maintain the current websites, which became a very expensive exercise for Rupia. A key part of the project was to deliver a functional website on, on GovCMS SAS, uh, eliminating the need for any third party. So GovCMS SAS was a good solution for IPIA as they um, provide all the maintenance services uh, for the CMS. As mentioned previously, uh, GovCMS SAS has provided the solution we need and was the core requirement for our project. It removed our dependence on any third party suppliers ensured the platform stayed up to date, provided significant cost savings for our department, which has been you know, very, uh, very much a, a big part of what we wanted to deliver. So GovCMS SAS made a lot of business sense. However, it did present many challenges for the redevelopment of the site, including the limitation on modules that can be used. Um, and, you know, we've mentioned uh, the views data export uh, module and really it, it provided the challenge of how we were going to import and export data and empower the content editors to achieve that. So um, we obviously had significant challenges in this project and we just thought um, we would finish up um, our talk with just a few slides on a couple of the largest ones and then some pointers on how we, we unblocked those challenges. So we were dealing with complex data sets. Imports um, on our local environments were working, but on the GovCMS SAS platform, um, the imports were failing. That made it really difficult uh, to troubleshoot, um, especially since they were fa failing silently. So we were not getting any error messages, no feedback, we were going through logs, nothing was coming up. Um, we were able with that, and it was really just the, 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 the biggest um, one with the 25,000 plus rows. So all the other smaller um, CSV files were, were just like on song, just importing perfectly. So we, we, we tried splitting the transactional data into three um, separate CSVs and uploading them, and that worked, but um, that was not acceptable to IPIA um, because they felt like there was too much room for human error in that. Um, so, and because we're getting no feedback from the CMS or from the logs, 
uh, we were really quite un unsure on what was actually happening, but we were 90% sure the issue was around the limitation of processing and server resources. So when you're on GovCMS SAS, you're on a, a shared resource platform. So at the moment, GovCMS and Amazie are currently working together to come up with a solution for us, which uh, we we're thought waiting. it would happen, <laughs> but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so um, that was with the importing. So then the other challenge we had was the exporting of data. Um, and it's absolutely vital that the IPIA team have the capacity to verify their data. It's obviously public facing. Um, they're, they're mandated to deliver this content to the public um, and it has to be 100% accurate. Um, so on the current site, they use Views Data Export Module to do this. Um, and then once they've validated it, um, they then um, put it onto data.gov.au. Um, so it's available there as a resource. This issue is still unresolved. Um, and we're currently working with GovCMS uh, to resolve this issue. So um, Matt and I have been aware for some time, like pretty much from the beginning of the project, that this was going to be an issue. Um, so we thought we'd just finish off with how, because it's been really useful for us to work out how we actually communicate to GovCMS and how we work with them to unblock issues like this. So really, number one is to talk to GovCMS and find out what the possibilities are. And the way we did this was, I think, Matt, you were talking to somebody at GovCMS. Yes, that's um, And you got wind of the fact that they were already looking at views data export. Um, so um, I would recommend to anyone working on the platform to join the GovCMS Slack channel because that's where I got to straight away and started to ask some questions about what the issues were um, around the module that we needed to use. Um, I found out very quickly that there were a few bugs that needed to be resolved um, and that was something that I could do something about. So I got my team members um, onto, onto those um, <coughs> bug reports on Drupal.org and um, started, they started to work on it to unblock um, those issues. Um, so that's really the kind of the core way that we're doing it um, and um, we're sort of slowly progressing. Yeah, so from a client's perspective, you know, we, I would recommend you know, getting in contact with GovCMS, submitting a business case, outlining all your requirements as to why, uh, but also then just to uh, be patient, sit and wait for a long conversation because it has taken us quite a while to, to get to where we are to hopefully get it resolved before the 9th of November. And that's our presentation. Do you have any questions? Yes, Helen. 37 questions. <laughs> I want to hear every single one of them. Um, so with the views export, does that allow external users to export your data from a view? So we would not recommend that. You can use it in that way, um, but it would o probably overload um, the resources on the so server potentially. To solve, so no, what them? we're trying to do is do it internally. So as an admin, you can go in and export the data. So if you had a very fixed requirement where they needed to be able to import the data to the CMS, but then they needed to export it and then verify it by a third party system to make sure it matched their other system. So as an admin, they can do yeah. that. So hopefully comparing the, the yeah. two versions to make yeah. sure that the imported data was exactly the same as what so it was originally. But the module allowed to do more. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And the other question was, um, oh, with your content type. So the person content type, so that's a content type or a taxonomy content type? Content, content type. Okay. I might take that offline and have a bit sure. of a chat with you about how that works. I'm going to be hovering around the yes. morph stand and we've got cupcakes. So oh, if anyone wants to come and talk to me afterwards, we'll be, we'll be there. Thank, Thank you, Helen. Oh, I guess I just wanted to know how much code you had to write in the theme to get it running. Uh, so or did you manage to do it all through views and config? Most of it is absolutely through views and config. And okay. really that, that, that query um, which um, Murray and the team developed between the aggregate and the detailed data, like 
I, I know views pretty well, and I didn't know how they were going to work that one out. So when I when I saw how they did it, I was quite amazed. Yeah, but I, I was sitting on the edge of my seat, going, "Are they going to? Do they really know how to do it?" Like. And the only other question I was going yeah. to ask, which is actually really relevant yeah. to what, what I'm doing, was, did you did it turn out to be the CSV format of the import being the issue? Like, if you've been able to do a Postman API request into a data source, would you have had the same limitations as the CSV was causing? I think the, the biggest issue with the CSV was the size of it. Just the sheer Just scale. The sheer and size the and scale. Because we had we have five of them, four of them. Not nice a problem. Small, but the twenty five thousand rows. So yeah. and they went up to forty thousand. Oh okay. Yeah, yeah, so we're really, you know, pushing so it. it was really the, you know, multiple joins into the content type that Drupal's doing when it goes to import that. Yeah. Okay. So and I don't I don't even know if it's exactly that because last week, because I was running all the test migrations, we had a beautiful day where it was just doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And I was just going, oh, this is amazing. We don't have a problem anymore. Came to work the next day and it was oh, just yeah, failing. Was every, every thousand records, it was failing. I was just sitting there all day doing other work, just hitting so refresh, refresh. Day, like, the so the day it worked, I had a sleepless night because I knew I had to give this talk and we hadn't got the data in there. I was up at 4 a.m. and I went from 4 a.m. to about 9 p.m. And I got like, I think almost three years worth of data in during that period. It would be interesting if you could control the import to the point that yeah. we get to 500 records, we pause, we come back, you know, half yeah. an hour later, we do the next 500, yeah. but all automated. Yeah. Yes. So I think we'll, we'll know by, so stay tuned, Good. you know, if you're interested, drop your business card off to me because I reckon by next week we'll know whether the additional resources is going to unblock us on that one. Yeah. Thank you, that was a great, um, so uh, quite interesting for, um, you said that from certain content types to actually increase content types and numbers and then you also mentioned about um, don't worry, really use text on me, which is quite an interesting to hear. Um, so my question is, um, I think from your business requirement, you think you want to actually group the data by content type rather than text on me. I yeah. certainly think text on me have a, um, some problem as well. Do you, uh, my question is, do you recommend um, use content type rather than text on me? Oh, that's just for your. I don't know. Your business requirement. Um, so I think I'm just I'm just going to bring this up because I think it's a really interesting one. So th these are the the two um, classifying content types here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so before I worked at Morph, I would make them taxonomies, and that's how I would tag my data. And all didn't keep the database put yeah. in smaller. Yeah. yeah. But I can see the beauty of this because it means that Matt can go in and he can create uh, an article type called blog, news release, media or press release, you know, I don't know what else you do there. Oh, so, you, know, you know, and then the public. Is that, is that a taxonomy, the type of the article? It's, well, so it's a content type and we, what we've got in there embedded is, is a view of listings. So a view block. Yeah, but if yeah. article type is the content type. Yeah. How do you, what's the definition, what do you use for defining we, like blog, we, media release? Yeah, so, we, yeah, I got you now. Yes. Okay, we create an art, so we'll call it a blog, okay? Yeah. And then when you create a blog article, you tag blog in there and it's it's doing an entity reference to there. Okay. And then you, we've got a views block display that just lists it, you know, as you would with a standard sort of view, okay. yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I, uh, I understand right now. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, we, um, I just want to understand the use case. So, the, the use case is that. Yeah, I understand now. So, yeah. I think, I think from use content type more flexible for the author. Yes. Uh, for editors, they can target on a view, create yeah. the view straightforward rather yeah. than target, target on text only, something yeah. like that. So, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably publication type is probably the better example because if you think, you know, you might want um, a page called annual reports and have them all listed there, but then next week you might go, oh, we've got a whole lot of fact sheets. And you don't want to go back to the developer to create all of that. 
this way as a content or do that? Or yeah, that? I think the question that I come from because I'm from development background, yeah. so I'll always ask her yeah. the best know why you want to contentize. Because people come to us like say, we, need, we want to contentize. And the first question I always ask, can you do different way uh, award content type? Yeah. So that's the question I come from, yeah. yeah. So come to our store and talk to Mo. All right. He's the, one, he's the brain behind the okay. okay. role. Yeah. One <laughs> other you. question, would paragraphs have worked as opposed to tax on the legal content type? Um, so that would be if you were manually building out a page, this yeah. dynamically builds out. Oh, no, no, so you know, you've got a reference to a mentally reference to the article type, oh. but would it have been any simpler to just entity reference a paragraph type with how, the same fields? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't even know if paragraphs are in the obvious here, Yeah, they are, yeah, they are, they are. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just curious yeah, about yeah. You know, the footprint. Yeah. Real quick, are you still blocked on uh, the, the actual module being included in CapCMS? Yes. Because okay. I know clients are working on it. There they are. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, all, we're all pushing <laughs> together. <laughs> no, no, because I think that there's a whole world out yeah. there that would love to see that module um, in the distro. The content export, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Thanks for time. Yeah, well, just, we'll just keep on talking and being <laughs> friends and we'll get there in the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.